evening, I'm Melissa Idris and you're watching Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Merdeka Day on the 31st of August commemorates the Malayan Declaration of Independence some 65 years ago. But the 31st of August is also significant for Sabah because in 1963, Sabah marked the end of colonial rule and was granted self-government with Thun Fat Stevens as Chief Minister. So today, let's speak to those who advocate for Sabah, particularly its children working to improve their access to education and ensuring that their welfare is not forgotten. My first guest today is Jennifer Lasimbang. She is the uh, she was the Assistant uh, Minister of Education and uh, Innovation for Sabah from 2018 to 2020. Jennifer, thank you for joining me on the show today. I thought maybe we can uh, begin our conversation by uh, you painting some broad strokes of the main issues that you think are important to highlight when it comes to the education system in Sabah. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa and Astro Awani, for having me. And um, of course, during the, the, the two years, that there's a lot of grounds to cover. And I'm very lucky to be given the portfolio as the Assistant Minister of Education and Innovation of Sabah at that point. But as you also introduced, uh, I also worked with UNICEF Malaysia before that. So I've, I've seen quite a bit. I did a bit of analysis uh, before that, before I actually became the, the Assistant Minister. But looking at Sabah's education and, of course, the access to education during the government, some of the things that I really I, I saw was in terms of um, the infrastructure is really, really at um, a very sad state at that time. Um, out of 1,200 and plus schools, uh, we were told and we went down to the ground actually to actually do some investigations and 600 of them, that means half of the schools are dilapidated. And when we did another round of uh, analysis or uh, evaluation, 100 schools are actually declared unsafe. So you can imagine the, 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 the a situation the children are, are studying and even access to going to the schools itself is really a huge, huge challenge. So today I'm just gonna, the whole conversation, Melissa is gonna talk about education as a right to every child and why is it important? Because there are some other very critical issues and very, in a way, sensitive to be said, for example, undocumented children in Sabah, right? So okay. I think that we'll, we will talk about that later. Yes, I, I definitely do want to focus on ensuring that every child has access to education, but allow me to focus on the infrastructure part first. That was shocking figures of the number of dilapidated schools and the schools declared unsafe. I, I also am reminded of a, a video that was, that surfaced recently of school children climbing the side of a, a, a water pipe. If you recall, you know that was above rushing water, uh, water of, of a river and they were trying to get to school. This over promises of a bridge that have, you know, for many years been left unfulfilled. Can I ask you about that access to, is that a given for the challenges of rural education that going to school means risking their lives every day for these children? Okay, definitely, Melissa, because being in the school itself is already a challenge. But getting to the school, we have problems with not just the rural schools, but the remoteness of it. You know, it's not just some of the schools are not access accessible by road. Like one of the schools, even nearby Pinampang, where I come from, I have to walk eight hours to get to the school. I'm sure you've seen a teacher carrying a freezer box and carrying it to the school. And it's an eight hour walk for me to get to the school. And of course, they are very remote, far flung islands of Sabah, right? There are schools mm. there. And the safety of the children going to school itself, right? Of course, there are um, asramas or hostels provided. These are, you know, uh, I've got information and also people calling me up for donation to, to change the mattresses every school opening because it infested 
by bed bugs. So children are staying or sleeping in a hostel with bed bugs. And that would definitely, again, becomes a, a hindrance to them to be able to focus at school. So these are just little, little things that eventually <laughs> will contribute and exasperate the situation for the children. Jennifer, then what is the way forward to address that? Is it simply more infrastructure or more schools? Uh, how, how are you thinking about what might uh, take away some of the barriers to, uh, for access uh, to education for children? Definitely, like if, if the budget is, is able to just, for example, focus on better infrastructure within the school itself. That's one. But the other thing is like providing better transportation, better roads or, you know, if the hostel I was talking about, Melissa, just give them better sleeping condition to start with and better nutrition, better food at school. You know, there was one time there was like um, the ronjangan makanan tambahan, right? Mm -hmm. So they were giving instant noodles to the kids instead of using what's available in the kampong, in the village, um, that is healthier for the children to consume. But I think we do have to monitor this from time to time. And also, it's, you know, it's, they say that it takes a community to build um, the education, the school, uh, to educate a child. So the whole community, the awareness, and those are the things that I always focus as you know, get the community to, to look at a school, to look at education as an, a shared responsibility. It's not um, a mom or dad sending the school, the kids to school, and that's it. My, I'm done, you know, wait for them to come back. No, because I noticed that uh, a school that's doing very well, they have strong uh, PTA, uh, parent teacher association, involved in the management of the school, doing activities with the children and the teachers, so that's, that's like a holistic approach towards developing and making the children feel like, wow, my mom and dad and the whole community is involved in, in the betterment of the access to education in, in, mm. in, in themselves. I, I, you, you pointed that you had worked with UNICEF previously, pre, uh, previously and I was wondering, you know, in that transition from say UNICEF to uh, state government, during your time as Assistant Minister for Education, what did you notice about the limitations, the constraints that state government has uh, in, to be able to address some of these very obvious and pressing problems? Okay, so I won't talk about the structural differences between you know, uh, education ministry in the federal and the state and it was a newly set up in ministry, but I won't talk about that. Instead, I'll talk about more on the undocumented children uh, issue, sure. all right? And it's not, uh, people always mistaken. When, when we talk about undocumented children in Sabah, it's like, oh, uh, children from uh, foreign workers and things like that. But unfortunately, people forget that children from rural and remote communities are also undocumented because the access to the parents going to register, uh, birth certificates and all that, even that is a problem. So we are trying to remedy that by having the mobile court going into the interior and making sure that children have at least, first of all, a birth certificate, an identity to start with, because that's important to, for the later stage in life, going to school, opening a bank account, um, going higher education, getting a job later on. So the most fundamental basic issue of documentation we need to address that and without a documentation you number one you will not get access to a government school right and even if you do you have to pay and these are malaysian children we're talking about right and also um we also of course look at uh the the schools for undocumented children and i always have like dialogue between ministry of uh, education moe to look at at least some form of a guideline to set up our alternative learning centers they call it here in sabah and some parts of uh, sarawak and perhaps in peninsula right. Malaysia. But in sabah there's a huge amount of uh, alternative learning centers and i was trying to bridge 
between uh, Ministry of Education Federal to be speaking to the alternative uh, learning centers management to just have at least uh, a common ground, a uh, basic guideline on how, what curriculum to use, how are we sorting out the teachers, what kind of resources needed because they are doing very, very important work for the children in Sabah and in Malaysia. Well, we're going to be speaking to several founders of um, alternative teaching uh, learning centres in Sabah on the show a bit later, Jennifer. I do want to ask you about the issue of stateless uh, children, undocumented children, and their limitations of being able to access uh, public education. Uh, how do we, you know, beyond uh, ensuring they get the, the correct papers, the, um, the, their inherent uh, right to, uh, for papers, how is there a way to ensure that these all children get education and the same level of education? The reason I'm asking is while these efforts are, are wonderfully sincere and um, you know uh, they mean a lot to the community, the alternative education is not at the same level as the national uh, and public uh, school education. How do we ensure that there isn't that disparity, that all children are getting the same level of education? Well, that's a huge, huge um, analysis to be done, actually, Melissa. And we have in, in, um, in UNICEF early on, we have already done out of school children uh, report. And we had focused on, you can read up about that. I think UNICEF has done a huge uh, research together with EPRD, the Ministry of Education, to address these issues. And um, it's, it's a good start to get to know what actually the challenges are. And there's a bridge, at least there's a bridge at the moment now with the, uh, the private unit, uh, uh, unit swasta in the Ministry of Education, to be able to at least have the initial discussion because People cannot run things in silos and um, the children initially who did not have documentation because of uh, the issues later on will get the documentation and join uh, Sekolah Kebangsaan or the mainstream. Now we have this um, the policy that children go to school according to the age, not by the cap capacity or capability of the child. So you can imagine a child only getting a documentation at age of 10 and it's supposed what a uh, age 10 is uh, uh, year, year four, two. right mm -hmm. year four. Oh yes yes yeah year four so you can imagine they have lost that first 10 years of initial early childhood education mm -hmm. and it will definitely bring down the quality of education within the uh, mainstream schools uh, 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 performance right so these are the balancing act that the ministry of education has to do and of course, we do not want to deny the right of the child to be able to go to access to the mainstream school. But unfortunately, we have undergone that documentation issue process, which did not allow them to join at you know year six or year five in primary or uh, pre-primary education. They have lost all those basic years. And those burden of getting, that's why getting the child to be at par with the other children becomes another issue for the school right so now this this whole issue is huge and of course we've got help from outside huh? for as long as we are willing to put things on the table let's talk about it let's who has got what to, you know resources is important um, there are teachers who are volunteering teach for Malaysia. There are so many NGOs who are, you know, just out there and really, really have the, the, you know, the passion and the same objective to make education as right for every child. Yeah, we're going to be speaking to some of them. Thank you, Jennifer, for speaking to me on the show today. Thank you for your work as well. That was Jennifer Lassimbang, former Sabah Assistant Minister of Education and Innovation. We're going to take a quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Amidst all the Merdeka celebrations, it is also important to remember and to commemorate that the 31st of August 
is also the day Sabah marked the end of colonial rule and was granted self-government in 1963. So today we're going to be talking and focusing on Sabah, uh, education in Sabah. Let's speak to Azrin Utong. He is the President and Coordinator of Programs in and operations for Cahaya Society or Pertubuhan Pendidikan Anak Cahaya Sabah. It was established in January 2019 and it focuses on the advocacy for alternative education for stateless children. Uh, it focuses on social welfare and also community empowerment in Sandakan Sabah. Azrin, thank you for joining me on the show. Can you tell us why you set up Cahaya Society? What was the need that you saw in your community? Apa yang diperlukan dalam community? Apa yang kekurangan yang diperhatikan yang mendorong Azrin untuk uh, menubuhkan Cahaya Society? Okay, baik. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Awani. So, uh, pertama sekali, apa yang mendorong kita sepasukan untuk menjalankan advokasi pendidikan adalah apabila kita melihat ketiadaan pendidikan dalam kalangan anak-anak yang keciciran pendidikan di Sabah ni sebagai satu malapetaka yang semua orang nampak. Um, berpuluh-puluh ribu anak-anak tidak dapat pergi bersekolah, masalah dokumentasi, tidak ada pemetaan yang serius dan uh, mereka ini tercicir dalam keadaan tidak faham tentang baik dan buruk. Uh, kemudian muncul stigma dalam masyarakat mereka ini dituding antara punca kriminal, antara punca jenayah yang berterusan sedangkan tidak ada akses pendidikan yang baik. Jadi kami terpanggil sebagai orang-orang muda, pasukan kita uh, dalam kalangan orang muda untuk memberikan pendidikan, advokasi dan membuktikan bahawa kita benar-benar duduk dengan anak-anak ini yang betul-betul kecisiran pendidikan, membuktikan bahawa dengan laluan pendidikan kita sedang mengusahakan satu perubahan yang lebih besar. Okay. Besar, bukan hanya untuk masa depan anak-anak tapi untuk masa depan negara secara umumnya. Asrin, keciciran pendidikan, apa, uh, so uh, Cahaya Society menggunakan uh, pendekatan pendidikan alternatif. Apa apa maksud pendidikan alternatif tu? Uh, bagaimana ia berbeza dengan uh, pendidikan, sistem pendidikan yang sedia ada, sistem pendidikan mainstream? Baik, basically sebenarnya kita menjalankan satu program pendidikan alternatif untuk anak-anak yang kesisiran pendidikan, terutamanya anak-anak yang ke- masalah dokumentasi dan jelas-jelas tanpa negara, stateless. So, isu dokumentasi mungkin saya tidak uh, bersentuh di sini, agak rumit perbincangannya dari sudut uh, perbincangan negeri dan persekutuan Malaysia. Namun, uh, program ini dijalankan untuk menampung kecisiran pendidikan yang uh, anak-anak ini tidak mampu pergi ke uh, sekolah arus perdana. Antara puncanya masalah uh, dokumentasi, kemiskinan disebabkan uh, bayaran yang tinggi sebab kita di sini 100% kita buat pendidikan percuma untuk anak-anak ni. So dia datang betul-betul bawa badan, jiwa yang bersungguh-sungguh dan kita bagikan pendidikan asas. Adakah kurikulum dia sama dengan pendidikan um, arus perdana? Uh, tidak. Prinsip kita di sini adalah kita menjalankannya seperti program tapi untuk tempoh masa yang panjang mungkin suka saya kongsikan di sini. Tahun ini, tahun keempat kami jalankan program ini kita sudah mem- membuat satu majlis graduasi untuk batch yang pertama dan itu pencapaian yang besar walaupun mungkin agak kelihatan kecil sebab kita berjaya daripada anak-anak buta huruf langsung tak pandai sentuh pensel yang boleh menggenggamnya dan mampu bercita-cita lah. So uh, program pendidikan ini um, agak tidak berbeza, uh, berbeza kurikulumnya kerana prinsip kita adalah apa yang anak-anak perlu bukan apa yang kita mahu berikan. Memandangkan diorang duduk dalam komuniti yang vulnerable, duduk dalam setinggan, so pendidikan kita harus lebih lestari, harus lebih menghargai alam, harus lebih bersifat uh, perbincangan ekonomi harus dalam lingkungan komuniti, uh, perniagaan-perniagaan ataupun aktiviti ekonomi yang berlangsung sekitar mereka. Okay. Azrin, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Appreciate your time. Azrin Utong, President and Coordinator of uh, Cahaya Society or Pertubuhan Pendidikan Anak Cahaya Sabah. We're going to take a quick break here on Consider This. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. <music> Welcome back. I'm Melissa Idris. Thank you so much for staying with me on Consider This. 
Mukmin Nantang is the founder of the Sabah-based NGO Borneo Comrade. Set, set up in 2017, Borneo Comrade runs Skola Alternative, which provides free education for stateless, undocumented and underserved children in Tawau, Sampurna and Kota Kinabalu. Mukmin, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Tell us a little bit about um, Skola Alternative, why you started it and who attends the school. Cerita sikit um, tentang Skola Alternative uh, dan Borneo Comrade. Uh, bagaimana uh, Mukmin um, menubuhkan uh, NGO ini dan untuk untuk siapa? Uh, okay, uh, sebenarnya sekolah alternatif ni uh, uh, saya buat untuk anak-anak stateless. Di Sabah ni ramai anak-anak stateless yang bergerak stateless kerana mereka tidak ada dokumentasi, mereka tidak ada kerakyatan Malaysia itu. Jadi sebenarnya kenapa saya buat benda ini? Saya daripada kecil, saya lihat ada kawan-kawan saya yang tidak mampu pergi sekolah. Jadi saya rasa uh, terkilanlah melihat ada anak-anak yang terdeda dengan masalah sosial, dia tidak mampu pergi ke sekolah. Jadi ini saya ambil inisiatif untuk membuka sekolah khas untuk mereka kerana saya percaya uh, semua kena, kena mempunyai hak yang sama untuk mendapat pendidikan. Sekolah alternatif um, men- menumpukan uh, memang untuk uh, kanak-kanak yang keciciran pendidikan uh, yang tiada dokumen, yang tiada kewarganegaraan tapi apakah pendekatan uh, uh, sekolah alternatif terhadap pendidikan dan kurikulum? Apa yang uh, anak-anak kanak-kanak ni belajar di sekolah alternatif? Uh, jadi uh... Di, di sekolah alternatif, uh, kita memperjuangkan supaya kanak-kanak, semua kanak-kanak ini dia keluar daripada buta huruf. Mereka tahu literasi, mereka tahu numerasi. Selepas itu sebenarnya kami anjurkan uh, kanak-kanak ini untuk uh, tahu tentang uh, kelas-kelas pemikiran, kelas-kelas kesenian dan kemahiran hidup. Kami di sekolah alternatif ini, kami punya kurikulum selepas uh, literasi dan numerasi uh, kita akan pergi pengukuhan kepada kemahiran-kemahiran. Mereka belajar menjahit, mereka belajar ber- tukar, mereka uh, belajar uh, mencetak baju dan sebagainya. Jadi kita memberikan mereka kemahiran-kemahiran baru supaya mereka boleh survive di masa akan datang. Hmm. Saya nak tanya Mokmin, uh, ada bantuan ke dalam uh, usaha Borneo Comrade dengan sekolah alternatif? Adakah kerajaan memberi bantuan peruntukan atau apa-apa jenis lagi uh, apa-apa support daripada uh, pihak kerajaan? Ada ke? Ya, uh, sebenarnya uh, sekarang ni buat, daripada permulaan kita buat ini Borneo Comrade adalah usaha daripada mahasiswa kita memang bergerak daripada sendiri dan sekarang ini banyak kita dapat bantuan daripada kawan-kawan awam ataupun NGO-NGO. Sekarang buat masa sekarang langsung tidak ada bantuan daripada pihak kerajaan dan uh, isu ini belum lagi mendapat perhatian yang uh, kukuh lah daripada uh, kerajaan Malaysia itu sendiri. Bagaimana kalau kerajaan nak membantu? Apa yang perlu kerajaan buat? Ya, sebenarnya kami sangat berbesar hati jika kerajaan mahu menjemput kami, membawa kami berbincang dan uh, mahu uh, melihat sendiri projek-projek uh, yang kami bangunkan dan mereka sama ada uh, bantuan ini kami tidak melihat terus kepada duit, kepada ekonomi. Kita juga boleh, kerajaan boleh membantu kita melegalisasikan kita punya, kita legalkan kita punya sekolah itu ataupun memberikan kita endorsement supaya uh, sekolah kita ini uh, berdiri dengan kementerian kanak-kanak atau kementerian dalam negeri boleh datang melawat sendiri sekolah-sekolah kami supaya kita boleh memperpanjangkan perbincangan dan boleh kita melihat bantuan-bantuan yang mana yang sesuai untuk uh, dibuat bersama. Ya. Adakah tanpa uh, legalisasi, that legalization yang Mukmin cakap tadi tu, tanpa that legalization, adakah ia menjadi satu cabaran kepada Um, Borneo Comrade kepada sekolah alternatif untuk da- dalam usaha untuk memberi pendidikan kepada kanak-kanak yang tercicir? Ya, ini adalah isu yang paling besar ketika kami tidak dapat legisa- legalisasi ini uh, kerana kami tidak diistiharkan sebagai uh, sekolah yang halal sekolah, kami tidak diiktiraf dan anak-anak itu tidak mendapat pendidikan yang lebih uh, spesifik. Jadi kita dan kita juga susah untuk membangunkan lebih banyak projek-projek pendidikan. Kita kawan-kawan kolektif Borneo Comrade ini kita banyak mau buka sekolah di merata tempat tetapi uh, gara-gara kita tidak dapat endorsement daripada pihak kerajaan untuk membuka uh, beberapa sekolah di dalam komuniti uh, kita menyukarkan lagi usaha kita untuk memberikan pendidikan yang lebih lebih banyak uh, di kampung-kampung Mokmin, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Mokmin Nantang from Borneo Comrade there wrapping up this episode of Consider This. 
I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching, and good night.